Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the TT Podcast. Just when you think a new generational talent is on the cusp of winning the next five Tours de France, another one comes along. Jonas Vinegar, a 25-year-old from Denmark, has won his first yellow jersey, and in resounding fashion too. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host Tom. Tom, how are you? Hi, everyone. I am... I know you want me to mention this while we're here. I'm a bit blindsided because I've turned on my camera to uh, record this episode with you and you are dressed in full polka dots. So I, you wanted me to comment on it off air. I'm just making sure that the listeners know as well exactly what you look like right now. Yeah, well, Tom, I've been on my holidays in France, haven't I? You have. And, um, the, the best thing about the publicity caravan, if you've not been to the Tour de France, what happens is about two hours before the riders come through, there is like a procession of the most incredibly wonderful and weird floats that come through and they are the most bizarre things and they throw they throw freebies onto the road right just vitel water bottles and stuff isn't it vitel wasn't here this year which was well, they oh, there was okay. a heat wave and i really <laughs> wanted vitel to be there um but no it's like washing up liquid um different key rings um random things anyway i think the best thing that they give away is the polka dot t-shirts that if anybody has watched any minute of the tour de france on tv which i'm sure you have otherwise why are you listening to this podcast um you'll know that there's a lot of them given out and they are probably as i said the best thing at the tour de france is given out and they're the easiest thing to get hold of so i'm sat here in my polka dot t-shirt and my polka dot hat trying to you know keep keep the vibe going it was mentioned uh i can't remember what stage i think it was one of the uh flatter stages where there's less to talk about um they basically said because there's not been many French winners, I say many, there's not been any French winners of the uh, yellow jersey in, you know, getting on for 40 years. And there have been quite a few French winners of the polka dot jersey. And it's so distinctive. It's an incredibly popular jersey within France. And it is the one you always see at the roadside. It's also a dream for the sponsors because of what it looks like. So that's why you see so many of them. There you go. Well, I believe that. Um, Tom, the last time we spoke about this race was after stage nine, won by Bob Jungles, and Taddy Pogacar had a 39-second lead that you told us he'd certainly extend. I forgot when I said that. <laughs> How do you reflect on your statements? Uh, well, um, I was wrong. I, I don't think I can deny that. Um, but can any of us honestly say we saw, saw that coming, what ended up happening? It was all that one stage. Um, it wasn't all that one stage. That's a very, very reductive way to look at these <laughs> last two weeks of the Tour de France, wasn't it? Um, the Col de Granon, stage... 11. I'm going to say 11. Yeah, 11. Yep. I watched it from the top of the Col du Telegraph, which I climbed up, but didn't fancy... Oh, no, wait, was that a different stage? That was the same stage. The Telegraph, then and the They Galibier, went over the... Um, and yeah. then the Granon. And then the following day, they went back the opposite way over the Galibier. That was right. Yeah. Um, I watched it from the top of there on a TV screen outside someone's camper van and <laughs> could not believe my eyes when I saw that Jonas Vinegar was putting three minutes into the yellow jersey. Yeah, um, it was one of those days, wasn't it? They just they lined up the whole team and said to uh, Tade, Look, <laughs> we're, we're coming at you. You've, you've got an entire stage, uh, 152 kilometres, and you are going to be defending and defending and defending. And they just broke him down and... Uh, when the decisive attack did come, he obviously couldn't go with it and just hemorrhage time over that. It was quite late on the climb, but over the final two or three K, he was he was going backwards very quickly. Yeah, I mean, on, on our last episode, Tom, I advised teams to, um, I'm, I'm not going to talk about consulting Jumbo Visma here, but I advised teams to um, uh, attack Tali Pogacar, and which is what they did from about 60 Ks out. Uh, yeah, well, whoever is consulting Jumbo is obviously doing a very good job because they got that spot on uh, on that day. And to, to be honest, uh, I don't think after the disaster of the first week where there's that what will now be infamous picture of them on the cobbles, you know, scrambling around trying to get the team back on bikes. Uh, I, the, the the following two weeks of racing, I think as a team, you couldn't really. And let's not forget, they you, you'll. You know, the caveat is that UAE lost riders and Pogacar didn't have many uh, lieutenants left. Lieutenants left? Uh, <laughs> it works, carry on. Yep, uh, left, uh, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to set things up for him as well. Um, but 
Jumbo lost. They lost Roglic. They lost uh, Kreisweik. They lost uh, Van Hooydonk. Yeah, Van Hooydonk. Um, so I don't think you could put it down to UAE's bad luck either. I think you really just have to put it down to the strength of Jumbo as a team and Jonas Vingigo as an individual. So you mentioned Jumbo and Jonas Vingigo there. Mm-hmm. Um, Jonas won the race, obviously. Yeah. But really, let's be honest, Tom, this was Wout van Aert's Tour de France. Uh, I feel that, well, you know what? Is that being too reductive again? No, I mean, they're teammates. Between the two of them, they have just... Uh, it's it's hard to talk about Wout van Aert at this point because I don't really understand how he does what he does. Yeah, there was an incredible moment on the Autocam in the, the... Was that the final mountain stage? It was. Um, where Wout van Aert is there in the green jersey, dropping Taddy Pogacar two-time Tour de France champion. He finished just, third on that stage. I don't, he kept going. Why would you keep yeah. going? What is the point? <laughs> having, spent the day, having spent the day in the break as well. His, I was looking up just before this, Tom. Where do you think Wout van Aert finished overall at this race? Right, here, here's a better question. Ooh. Where would you expect the green jersey to usually finish finish at this race? Oh, Lantern Rouge. Yeah, so when, there's usually about 140-ish riders usually finish the race. Yeah. And you'd expect them to be in the bottom 40, definitely. Yeah, I mean, well. I've seen this talk about, you know, could he be a GC rider and people going, oh, no. And like, of course he could be. If he went for it, he's clearly got the legs and the climbing ability. And if they bring proper time trials back in, he'll win them as well. Uh, he could win the GC comfortably if he ever targeted it, I feel. Back to my question. Where do you think he finished? 22nd. You're spot on. Am I really? 22nd. That was a, that was a complete guess. No, you've been doing your revision. <laughs> no, it genuinely happened. You didn't know that? No. That's that was a complete. That was a complete guess. Okay, well done. Um, if I, honestly, I've, if I had been doing my revision, I would have told you and gloated about it, but that was a complete guess. The 22nd, but he was over an hour and a half down. But yeah. um, he took it easy some of the days. I mean, it, like the final day in Paris, he didn't sprint. We can forgive him for that. Um, well, I can't really because I captained him in my fantasy team. But, and, um, and lost as a result. And lost as a result. Um, <laughs> he won the time trial. He crushed the time trial. Three stages in total for the second year running. And how many times did he finish second as well? At least twice. Yeah. I mean, yeah. across his career, countless. I mean, at this race, it was definitely... He podiumed in a sprint that Philipson won at one point. Um, uh, did he not finish second to... Uh, so the opening time trial, did he not finish second to Lampart there? He did. did oh, he... The first three stages in Denmark, I'm sure he was second twice. He was second in a sprint, and was he not You're second right. in the time trial as well? He was. He was. Yeah, because um, he took the yellow jersey despite finishing second in that sprint to Jakobsen on stage two, didn't he? Oh, you got a good memory, Tom. Yeah, um, <laughs> I watched it. <laughs> Tom, talking about second place, let's talk a bit about Taddy Pogacar. And there are a few moments in this race where he came across as this kind of fallen champion. And I'm talking about the Col de Granon and the Autocam, where we saw him. And I think for the first time probably in his career, truly, truly suffering, jersey unzipped, flapping in the wind, doubled over the handlebars, like really on the ropes. Yeah, it was, uh, it almost felt like, you know, you've walked in on something you're not supposed to see because I would never seen him like that before. And it was a big shock. Um, in a way, it was quite good because the problem with Tadej Pogacar, and I say this, at the problem is that he's so good and has been so dominant, but he's like, he's such a nice guy as well. He's It's he, impossible to dislike him. But the worry for me was that he was going to turn up and just dominate this race for the next 10 years. And to the fact that he clearly has some competition and can be beaten, to me, is a very good thing. Yeah, I, I quite like, there's something quite beautiful about the the myth of the superhuman mm. kind of unraveling before you on TV. Um, when you see him, and, and as you say, he's always very graceful about it. He's always very dignified about it. He took it so well. Um, but on, on the podium, he was going up every day to collect his white jersey and big grin, smiling every single time, always the first person ever to Vinegar. You mentioned the white jersey. He's obviously still got most of his career ahead of him because he's eligible for the white jersey next year as well. So <laughs> um, when, you, when you're as old, you know, as young, I say it's old, when you're as young as he is, you've already won it twice. And you get beaten by the better guy one year. I think you, you know, if you know you've got the talent he has, you're pretty confident you can say, well, I'm going to have 
plenty more cracks at this one. I'm going to come back next year and I'm going to win it again. Do you think he was frustrated throughout the last, certainly throughout the last week? Do you think he, because he never came across as being angry or annoyed or frustrated, but do you think he was? Like the amount of times he attacked Vinegar and just couldn't get away from him? I, I don't know. Look, obviously he's there to win. It would be frustrating not to win. But if you know you've gone in it every day, done everything you can and crossed the line with absolutely zero left in the tank, which is the impression I got from him, then just you hold your hands up and go, look, I've been beaten by someone stronger than me. Uh, I, if you, As long as you know that you couldn't have done anything more, I don't think you can feel too frustrated or let down by it. Yeah, and he was always very pleased with it as well. Like when he won that stage 17 on Peragut, where he, him and Vinegar had a full-on battle to the yeah. line. He has won three stages this tour as well. For most people, this would be a very successful tour. Yeah. Second on the GC and three stages. If you offered that to me now, I'd take it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Actually, talking about successful tours, Tom, um, I haven't done a quiz for you this week, but I was travelling back from France yesterday and I bought a copy of L'Equipe. Mm-hmm. And as you'll know, as somebody who follows football, L'Equipe are quite famous within the footballing world for the scores that they give to players. Yeah. They have given scores to each team at the Tour de France. I know. I'm, so I don't know the, the individual scores, but I have seen this alluded to, and I've seen screenshots, but I can't remember what of. And all I know about these scores is that they were so harsh. They, this is the thing. L'Equipe are always very, very harsh. I think famously they've only ever given footballers 10 out of 10, like three or four times. Mm-hmm. It was like messy and... Dusan Tadic actually won one when he was playing for Ajax against Real Madrid. Of course, you Madrid. remember this one. I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's for a different podcast. Former Southampton player Dusan Tadic, to give him his full name. Former Southampton player Dusan <laughs> Tadic once got a ten in their keep. Now, Tom, at the Tour de France this year, they gave a ten to one team. Which team do you think that was? I. It has to be Jumbo. It is Jumbo, and do you know yeah. what? I don't think I agree with it. We well, don't agree with. Winning three jerseys and however many... I'm just going to count up that. One, two, three. Uh, five. They won five stages. Four, five. five. I've, got, I've got six here. Have you? Uh, Van Aert. Van Aert, three. Van Aert. Vinegard, two. Laporte. Laporte, one. Okay, that's six. Let <laughs> keep have misprinted. Either that or I can't read. Um, but I, I just think they're to be a 10 out of 10, they usually say you have to be like flawless, as Dusan Tadic was that night at the Bernabeu. Well, so you're saying they should have all they, of they the... had a few calamitous moments, I think. No, 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 no. I'm not saying all, all eight riders top eight GC and win every stage, otherwise, you don't get a 10 out of 10. Essentially, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not. Obviously, that's not what I'm saying, but I think they had a few tactically dodgy moments. Um, in the end, it worked out, but you know. Look, I mean, Roglic having to put his own shoulder back in place is obviously not ideal circumstances. But as a team, I don't think you can do much better than six stage wins and three jerseys. Okay. Um, three, <laughs> oh, yeah, it was three jerseys as well because Vinegar won the polka dots. Yeah. Um, right. Here's your next question on this. Four teams scored a one out of ten. Mm-hmm. Can you try and name them? <sighs> I'll tell you, actually, you know what? Most of the teams scored like a four or less, to be honest. I don't know well, why. I don't know I what tour fans they were watching. There's been four or five teams who really have turned up and dominated this tour. You look at the teams that have got the stage wins. Obviously, Jumbo got six, which is a quarter of the stages which is locked greedy. out straight away. Yeah, um, more than a quarter. It's close to a third. Um, Bike Exchange took two. Pogacar has obviously taken three himself, which is three for UAE. Uh, what? Israel Premier Tech took two. Alberson took two. Alberson took two. And Quickstep took the first two. So, yeah, there's really... Obviously, Pidcock took uh, one for Ineos. There's, it's been slim pickings for everyone else. Yeah, and when you bear in mind that a lot of teams come to this race with the only ambition of winning, winning a, a stage, stage. Um, the, the golfing class is widening and widening, it seems. Okay, so the ones... Yeah, four of them. Ha- have to have gone to Astana did absolutely nothing they may as well not have been there they have to be one of the ones so Astana got a two <laughs> um, 
and it was because um, Alexei Luxenko managed to get himself in the top 10 at the end. Okay. Um, all right. B&B Hotels. They got two as well. Um, not really sure why. I think probably just because they're French. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I, I want to say Cofidis because they famously don't win stages at the Tour, but they're also French, so I thought they might give them a bit of an easy run as well. Yeah, they, they're quite brutal in here. They've said here... Okay. Um, Franck Bronnemore was like a ghost in this race <laughs> for BMB. Um, no, the fours are... I'm not uh, sure not Go on, keep going. Movistar. No, not the fours, the four one-star ones. Movistar yeah, is four, one of them, correct. Movistar is one of them. Um, Which I think was quite harsh because like Matteo Jorgensen was up there quite a lot and also Enric Mass was jostling with them in the first few weeks at least. Yeah, I don't know. Um and I'm, 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 not one I'm quite happy. I'm quite Movistar. happy with Moby Star having a one. Uh, Lotto Sudal must be a one. Lotto Sudal are a one. Yeah. Um, tactically, I just they put all their eggs in one basket, and, and that then, basket looked absolutely shattered for the whole race. And barely even sprinted. Yeah. And barely even <laughs> sprinted. Um, you have to admire the dedication to that one idea, though, don't you? Well, when Caleb Ewan's fit and healthy, he's incredibly quick. Uh, but he obviously, he just, he well, he wasn't fit and healthy. He looked battered and bruised for most of it with his legs in um, a sort of, what was it? Um, what's the word I'm looking for? It looked like he was wearing fishnet tights at one point, but that's probably not like what it gauze. was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we'll go with fishnet tights. I quite like yeah. that. <laughs> uh, right. That's two of them. You've got two more. Uh, so I've got the list of teams here and I can't think of, any here that have had a worse impression on me this tour than Astana, who got a two. So, oh, I don't know. Total Energy. Yep, Total Energy got a one. See, that seems harsh, because I think Sagan was up there in a few sprints. Pierre Latour was getting himself about in the mountains. I know. Honestly, I, I do not know who's come up with these. I don't know. Um, they don't put a name on who's come up with these, I think. I'll be honest, DSM we can't, didn't we can't do much. They up. must be the other one. What do you mean DSM didn't do much? Bardet was firing on all cylinders. Oh. Bardet came seventh in the end. No, nah, he was going to... Okay, they got, they fine. Got four out of ten. Got... Uh, right, mm. your last one, Tom. Who is it? It is Bahrain Victorious. Now, what do you make of that? What? That's disgraceful. Well, I think that the, the grounds that they give on that is that, obviously, Jack Haig and Damiana Caruso fell out of the race, or dropped yeah. out of the race, rather. Um, Mate Mohoric was one that they thought was going to do big things and he did basically nothing the whole race but they've obviously overlooked a certain British rider I can't believe that Fred was up there every day I think Fred was in the break four times or three times one of the days he came second he came second no he came okay. second one of the days he came top 10 in the in the TT top 10 in the sprint on the Champs-Élysées Fred had an absolutely unbelievable tour. Was he not second? I thought he was second. No, the the finish up to uh, Mejev on the Altiport, he um, he basically uh, they had Luis Leon Sanchez out front, didn't they? And Fred was back in, in with the rest of the break, just closing down every move. Uh, absolutely rode himself into the wall, and then still had to go at the sprint up the Altiport, and unfortunately didn't have the legs. Yeah, that's correct. And I'll tell you what, I was just reading the piece in keep just then and he doesn't even get a mention so uh, shocking. they've clearly just completely forgotten about him for for a young british rider uh he had one of the best tours i think i've ever seen i think so and that is saying a lot mm. when tom pidcock won on alp duez and for me fred wright's performance at this race kind of eclipsed that because he was so constant at the sharp end it's interesting because I think Pidcock probably gets overlooked a bit as well, just because he's at a British team. Like he has come through the setup in that way, where you see Fred at a foreign team, and um, it's almost almost like these guys have slipped through the net. Like when you saw the Yates brothers um, at, at Bike Exchange, they're called now, and I've, it's very nice to see British riders performing well, having sort of come through their own way rather than coming through the setup at Sky slash Ineos. I agree. And I think what it's meant for riders like Fred is that they are given more license to have really big digs in races. And that's what we saw. Um, and I'm going to play a little clip now, Tom, which is from when I caught up with Fred Wright in Paris immediately after the race. Immediately uh, on, after he finished 10th. 10th in the sprint uh, on the Champs Elysees, uh, just to get his reaction on how his second Tour de France had gone. 
Um, Fred, the way you've been racing this Tour de France, I was almost expecting you to try something quick on the last kilometre. Nah. <laughs> Did it cross your mind? You don't, it's too fast, man. You know, like, you, the effort required is immense. You know, like, the, the guys on the front are killing themselves. So I, I kind of thought, oh, I made my message like, oh, surely you should attack on the Sean Elysee. It's better than coming 10th in the sprint. It's actually Leo Hayter talk, said that to me, and I was like, yeah, you're right, but <laughs> in the end I came dead for the sprint, so that, that was what I did. Yeah, yeah, you won't make the finish line if you do that. Yeah, yeah, but uh, how do you reflect on these last kind of three weeks? Oh, for me it's been, can we, can we start rolling yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, for me it's been so good, like, I, I've loved it. I loved it last year, like, I, loved, I think I loved it more this year, you know, like, we haven't had the same team success, but I've just, I, I'm just, I've just sort of stepped up a level and, yeah, I, I want more to be honest. Like, I don't want, I don't want it to end. Greedy. Like it's gets, it's so much fun. Like, yeah. I and mean, yeah. we can really see you kind of evolving into a more mature, a more aggressive rider. Brad, yeah. you've got some people at the side of the side of the road shouting for you. That's what I mean. Like, I, I, I've got like actual got like fans, fans now. It's just strange, you know. Like the people cheering on the side of the mountains that like, I've never seen before in my life. Like. It's a bit weird. I don't like it. I think that's not surprising the way you've kind of lit up this Tour de France. Was that your plan from the start to do that? Or was that just something that you felt you had good legs and you just go for it? I think I knew I had good legs to get a result, but maybe not repeatedly do what I've, do, like, try, you know? Yeah. Like a few days ago. I didn't I didn't think I'd be in that position to be doing that, but no, I'm, I'm so happy and yeah, I can't wait to just celebrate now. That's great. Well, I mean, on behalf of, I would imagine, every single British viewer, Thank you so much for giving us something to shout at the TV for, and thank you so much for lighting this oh, race up. That, that's no, that's it means a lot, man. It's been it's been a hard three weeks, but yeah, I've loved it, and yeah, it's great. It's great. Tour de France. <laughs> Can't get much bigger than that. It is. It's really interesting to hear Fred talk like that because, look, I'll be honest. We we had him. Uh, we interviewed him earlier in the year, and he was great to speak to, but. I personally, and I'm sorry, Fred, if you're listening to this, didn't envisage that he'd have the race he's just had. And I think he's perhaps the same because you hear him talk about there, you know, most people who come through a three week Grand Tour are quite pleased for it to end. And he's, he just wants more. For him to be able to come out of that race and feel disappointed and hard done by that him and his team haven't won a stage is testament to, to where his ambitions are. Um, but this is what I want to talk to you now about, Tom, is winning stages at the Tour de France. Mm -hmm. And I think historically, we've seen sprinters win a lot of stages. Um, Mark Cavendish, as I'm sure you're aware, Tom, has won quite a lot of stages at the Tour de France. 34. Is it 34? I, 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 let me check that. Yeah. It, is, it is 34. Yes, it is 34. But... Um, and I am here now, Tom, to declare that the days of being a pure sprinter at the Tour de France are over. Please tell me why. A number of reasons, Tom. I think... The tour organizers are moving away from super flat stages. They're finding them boring. A lot of the, well, no, not they're finding them boring, but they're finding that I think you'll probably find that the viewing figures are not very good for them. And France Television are probably not happy with that. Um, they want stages that are a bit more complicated, a bit punchier. Um, there were very few opportunities for sprinters at this race. And one of them at the end was kind of stolen in a heist by Christophe Laporte. Um, I also think that the, level at the Tour de France is getting too good for the sprinters. And I don't mean that in an offensive way to say sprinters are subpar cyclists. I mean that in a way that the pace, the average pace, I mean, this year was the fastest ever Tour de France that we've witnessed. And that means they're going faster up the climbs and faster over the punchy hills, which is just shaking off sprinters and taking a lot more out of them attritionally. Possibly, but I mean, I'm looking at it here. There was a, there's you say Laporte stole one. Uh, I mean, Laporte, until he moved to Jumbo, was technically a sprinter himself. Uh, I think that there, even in this route, which was, you know, has been talked about for really not having many sprints, I think you still have to look and say there were at least five sprint stages, which is a quarter of the race. I think there's plenty there for the sprinters if they want it. Um, you're right. I'm, I, I don't know. That stage into Calais, I think, is another one that got stolen when Wout uh, went over the top and TT'd away because I think they probably thought that one would come down to the to the bunch as well. But 
if you're Jasper Philipson and you've come away with two stage wins, I don't think you're coming coming away thinking, oh, there's not enough in it for the sprinters. It's only in the years of sort of when you had, we've had 10, 15 years of really, really dominant sprinters between Cav and then Kittle when he was on his form was untouchable as well. It's not that common for a sprinter to turn up at the tour and take four or five stage wins like like Cav used to. If you come away with two, I think you're very happy. I think it is not that they're a dying breed. I think they're a dying breed at this race. And I can't remember who it was. One of the sprinters, maybe it was Fabio Jakobsen. Actually, it's probably not fair to say that to attribute these words to him. But there was some <laughs> A rider who said, look, if they're going to keep putting this many high mountain stages and very few sprint stages in for us, we're just going to stop turning up. And I think when you look at the winners of this race and the stage winners, you have riders like Mads Pedersen, Michael Matthews, Wout van Aert, who I am going to refer to as nuanced sprinters who are kind of more sturdy, physical, you know, not the fastest on the pan flat, apart from, wow, who can do anything. Um, but when there's a more complicated, you know, punchy finish, they're your people to bet on. Yeah, but I think they get, I think they get their own stages. There's always a couple of classic style stages. If you're Michael Matthews or Mads Pedersen, I mean, as you say, wow, doesn't really count because he can fall into any bracket. Let's but, just uh, drop wow from the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think you're looking at, uh, the cobbles or sort of those finishes, the stage that Pedersen won into San Etienne. You want, you know, relatively flat, but a little kick at the end, um, which to be honest, are the sort of stages I used to love because um, it's, it's Philip Gilbert territory, isn't it? Well, uh, Philip Gilbert uh, races last race now, Tom. So um, are you emotional about that or are you kind very, of very, celebratory about his career? Very sad, but uh, he he's going out on his own terms and he's quite happy with it. So Phil's happy, I'm happy. That's great. That's lovely. Um, Tom, I'm going to ask you a question now, mm-hmm. which is a very simple one. What was your favourite win, favourite victory, or kind of favourite stage in general of this year's Tour de France? <laughs> you know what? You you told me to prepare this, and it took me about three seconds to think of it. And it might be a popular choice, but it, it's Tom Pitcock winning on Outdoers. Um Partly because it's Alp Duez and it's Tom Pitcock, young British rider, but not just for the, um, you know, the significance of that finish and of that stage, but the way he did it as well, the way he bridged across on the descent with some of the most daring riding I think any of us have ever seen. And then he attacked very early on that final climb and just left everyone behind and paced it in. It was so impressive um, that, you know, if, if he'd ridden like that over onto another summit finish that wasn't Alp Duez, I still think I probably would have picked that as my favourite. You see, Tom, I'm concerned here because I know that one of your favourite pastimes over the last few weeks has been comparing my Strava times up these climbs to those of the stage winners. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm really hoping you don't have these at hand, but I know that Pidcock, unsurprisingly, absolutely slaughtered me on that one. I haven't got them to hand, but I did tell you the day after that Pitcock put you in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, he was very good. Um, and I was stood uh, about two thirds of the way up, having gone up and come back down. Um, and just bragging that I got to the top of Alp Duez there, in case that anyone thought that was implicit. I'll put that out there explicitly to say I climbed Alp Duez. Um, what was I saying again? Tom Pitcock, oh, it yeah. doesn't matter now. You've told everyone you climbed up Duas. That's all that matters. Well, that's the main reason for this episode, really, Tom, yeah. <laughs> is to deliver the great news to everybody. No, Tom Pitcock looked like he was flying when he came up. Um, and he had quite the gap when he came past us. And I was like, not a chance he holds on. Somebody's going to catch him. Um, well, and they didn't. I had people... helps that he has the yeah. next nearest rider to him is Chris Froome. I had people messaging me on the day going, you know, I think Pickock's going to do this. I said, no, no chance. The other people in that break are far stronger. So they're going, Nilsson Palace got the best legs of his life. He's going to fly up here. Louis Mikey's as well was yeah, flying. What happens there? Honestly, seconds after I sent the message saying Palace is going to win this, he's dropped off the back. <laughs> um, do you know what my favourite stage was, Tom? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Go on. So I'm, Why torn, not? I'm torn between two. Um, one of them was stage 11, which we've spoken about, which was the Col de Granon, mm-hmm. where Pogaccia cracked and Vineyard sailed to yellow jersey glory. Um, but I think the one I'm going to go for is stage 16, 
which was won by Hugo Uhl. That was a very uh, poignant moment when he crossed the line. That was nice as well. Yeah. It was beautiful. And I think the commentary as well on Eurosport GCN, Rob Hatch, when he went under the Flamme Rouge, Rob Hatch starts to tell the story of Hugo Uhl and his brother, who was killed by a drunk driver in a hit and run. Uh, and how the two of them, when they were younger, used to watch the Tour de France. And Hugo Uhl had promised or kind of made it his career mission to win a stage at the Tour de France. And as that, you know, as this final thousand meters is playing out, Rob Hatch is delivering this beautiful story. And he almost, it, it's time to perfection. He finishes it the moment he crosses the line, signs to the sky and bursts out into tears. And I was like, this is like, that. I think that was the moment for me where I thought this is more than a bike race. It was great. And I remember, I, I remember, I heard them saying that the actual, the plan for, um, from the team as well for Israel Premier Tech was for um, was for Ugo Wool to be up the road as the sort of foil, and actually they were it was Mick Woods was their big um, big aim to to win the stage, and then you're right he just had this willpower and stayed out front and did it on his own instead. Yeah, and it was a beautiful, beautiful moment I think, and that was surprisingly. I mean, Ugo Wool is one of those stage winners that you would think is quite forgettable at the Tour de France, but that one has really left an impression on a lot of people. Yeah, no, that one will definitely stick for a rider who, you're right, doesn't live long in the memory of even the, you know, most diehard cycling fans. Yeah, okay. That's probably quite a sour note to leave that on, Ugo, if you're No, listening, that's, but, it's um... not meant to be, you know, in any way disparaging, but um, yeah, everyone knows what I mean. <laughs> we know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tom, another question for you. Mm -hmm. Was this Tour de France one for the ages? This Tour de France is the best Tour de France I've ever seen. Yeah? Yep, 100%. There's been a lot of people who've been saying this is the best Tour de France in recent memory, Tom. And I'm going to ask you to kind of justify why you think that is. It's, I, it's quite simple for me, really. There, I think there are two factors. One is that we've got a very, a, you know, such a nice bunch of riders. The, the, um, the, the camaraderie within the peloton just seems you to be... You can't just say it because they're nice boys. No, I said there's two factors. Um, they, they seem to get on with each other and they... You know, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of camaraderie. The relationship seems really good. And I do think that adds something to it. And hopefully it's not all just for Netflix. We'll see. Um, but second to that is that they just all seem to love racing. The whole race, as you said, fastest average speed. It was full gas every day. There was always someone trying something different. And I say someone, quite often it was Tadej Pogacar or Wout van Aert. Between the two of them, they, they more or less lit up every day. Um, it goes back to your point about the sprinters as well. Even the, um, the more mundane flat stages, I just don't think there was a, a regulation day where something out of the ordinary didn't happen. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Um, I am reluctant to not reluctant. I agree with everything you just said, but I'm reluctant to put it down as like the best one I've ever seen because for me, the GC battle wasn't really on after Vinegar took three and a half minutes, whatever it was on Pogacar. There was no moment where I thought Pogacar is going to overturn this. Um, same applies to the polka dot Jersey in the second half of the race. We oh, knew that was only going no, one way. No, no, no. On. We knew that was only going one way. Poor Simon Geschke. And even this race, they'd got rid of the like double points on summit finishes to try and make it more interesting. And it was still won by the overall leader. Um, and likewise, even more so, there was no battle for the green jerseys. So for me, it was an excellent race, but none of the jerseys were really that hotly contested. I get that. <laughs> I like one day racing and this just seems to be like 21 one day races, which is probably why I liked it so much. Um, you're right. In terms of the whole three weeks as a grand tour. Um, I, I'm not sure about the GC. Yeah. You go, did win by a lot, but even into that final time trial, you weren't sure were you? it was close enough to, to keep you interested. So here's a stat for you. Um, had Vinegard not sat up, to take a picture with his teammates and lose. And he lost, what was it, 50 seconds or something on the last day on the Paris stage because he was waiting for them all to kind of gather in. Did he? I actually thought picture. they I thought they tended to neutralise the times after uh, once they get to the Champs-Élysées. No, no, he lost 50 seconds on that day. Oh, I didn't um, know that. <laughs> and um, had he not done that, the gap between first and third place would have been, I think, the largest in history or at least the largest since Nibali won in 2014. 
but Geraint Thomas managed to get another 50 seconds back on him on the last day. So it went down. Um, but it was like seven and a, seven minutes or so, um, which is a, a large gap. I mean, there was only the two of them contesting the GC, but it was not really in any doubt, certainly in that last week. No. I, which I, I admit is very easy to say with hindsight. No, I didn't necessarily doubt it, but there was, it wasn't over. You didn't know with that time trial, and perhaps it was because of what Pogacar did to Roglic two years ago. Yeah, two years ago. And I know that that was a, that was a mountain time trial, and Roglic maybe didn't quite have the best day, but there was some precedent there. And I think you just always thought, yeah, it could happen. It didn't, but it could. Okay. Well, on that note, Tom, the Tour de France is over, but the whole kind of spectacle of it is not over. We've got the Tour de France fam at the moment. And the day that we are recording this episode on, we have had an exceptional finish into Epernay. Um, but we will save that, Tom, for our Tour de France fam recap episode, which will be out next week. Um, do you have any kind of closing remarks on this year's Tour de France, Tom? Uh, no, you've um, you've sprung a surprise there with closing remarks, to be honest. Um, just that I think, fantastic race. I hope it continues in that vein. And um, yeah, I think got the uh the rest of the season looks like it's shaping up to hopefully be more of the same okay well do you want to sing us out with the socials then sing you don't have to sing <laughs> uh okay well i will say as i always do that you can find us at ttp that was part of me there that thought you were actually going to sing no um absolutely not all right I'm... sorry i've spoken over you. you're gonna have to start again as always people can come and find us at ttpdcst and I am, yeah, not singing that. <laughs> okay, wonderful. I mean, on what sites can they find us on? Oh, true. Right, you've really, I, I've forgotten half I've of what I'm supposed to say. I've derailed the whole because, thing. <laughs> uh, they can find us on Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> Christ, what a mess. We're knackered after this race. Look, okay. I've had a very long, I've been to Glasgow for the first time today. It's been a very long day at work. Okay, well, sorry that you're tired. Um, <laughs> but you're glad to hear you're working hard. Anyway, let's wrap this up. Yeah. Tom, a pleasure to speak with you. Tour de France organizers, thank you for making it the race that it was. Uh, and most of all, listener, thank you for tuning in to listen to us once again. We will speak to you very soon with our recap of the Tour de France fam, Avec Zwift. But until then, take care and thank you very much. I thought you were going to thank the riders for making a great race, but no, thank you, listeners. Yeah, you're the ones who matter. Thank you. And the riders, thank you. Take care.